let's do this, guys. So, John, you're able to see us. Okay, and you're also able to hear us from the YouTube or not? Okay, great. Excellent for everyone watching. We're just doing um, a test here. <laughs> Excellent. We'll start up around uh, seven o'clock, about a minute. After We're just doing, uh... All right, everyone, we'll get started in just a minute.
Okay, well, welcome everyone to our introductory webinar on applications of AI. Um, this webinar was uh, open to all applicants for our Data Science for All Empowerment Program. So uh, thank you all for applying and welcome to our Data Science for All Empowerment uh, community. Um, we wanted to tell you, my name, by the way, is uh, Rashid Sabar. I'm a co-founder and co-CEO at Correlation One. And I wanted to take just a few minutes to tell you a little bit about Correlation One, a little bit about the program, and then introduce Professor Polai, who's going to be the star of the show and, and walking all of you through the actual applications of AI. So um, let me share uh, a deck that we have prepared here. Uh, and let me full screen this. Okay. So first of all, who is Correlation One? So Correlation One is a company that my business partner, Sham, and I founded about five years ago. And we founded it with a very simple worldview. And that's that we believe AI and data science will prove to be one of the biggest megatrends in history. Um, we also believe that the biggest unsolved problem in AI is people. You know, everyone thinks about AI means automation, means jobs are going away. But the reality is the hundreds of millions of jobs that will remain um, are going to change in nature. In particular, we don't think of data and data competency and data literacy and data fluency as a vertical that just kind of one section of the, pop of the kind of employment population needs to know. No, in fact, data is a horizontal that cuts across more and more roles. So whether you're going into sales or you're going into marketing or you're going into product or you're going into software engineering or you're going into research, um, data and data literacy in our increasingly data oriented economy is a competitive advantage. And we started Correlation One in order to make data literacy your competitive advantage, whether you're an enterprise or you're a person. Um, we work with some of the biggest and most sophisticated um, employers in the world um, in financial services and, and uh, technology. Um, and you know, for all of you participating in our data science for all empowerment community, um, those client networks where we've already validated their need for data talent, um, uh, all of you can benefit from that um, as these same employers look to hire AI and data talent. So now, um, what? okay, so we want to increase access to data literacy. How do we do that? Um, uh, outside of our enterprise focused programs, we have a big emphasis on uh, making global AI ecosystems more inclusive because left to their own devices, they won't necessarily be inclusive. And so we've done programs like our Data Science for All um, Columbia program, where we're, we're focused on bringing a, you know, the, 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 the qualified applicants in an entire country up to be able to compete in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, uh, you know, we love our Colombian students and that's been a fantastically successful program um, as part of the developing world uh, agenda that we have. We also have a program that we call Data Science for All Women Summit, where um, you know, we provide a completely free technical training, uh, mentorship, and connections to jobs for aspiring women data scientists. Um, in fact, we just graduated a class of 225, um, and all of you are welcome to tune into the grand finale tomorrow. They have amazing projects, and you can get a little bit of a sneak preview for what it looks like to go through a multi-week training uh, program for Correlation One. Um, and then our latest program is Data Science for All um, Empowerment. And here our, 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 our basic idea is that um, at the very end of the day, um, uh, equality and social mobility uh, relies on equality of economic opportunity. And equality of economic opportunity in turn um, relies on equality of you know, access to education and, and knowledge. And that we recognize that there are enormous barriers to accessing uh, world-class um, uh, data and AI knowledge because that data revolution has come so quickly. Um, and our goal with Data Science for All Empowerment is to create a inclusive, merit-based, completely free technical training plus support system program with mentors plus an economic program where we help connect all of our graduates to jobs um, and we're sort of flipping the education business model on its head where the way we're able to offer this education um, is instead of, you know, putting the economic burden on the students, 
um, uh, getting corporates instead to buy into our vision and through their desire to be good corporate citizens to help us underwrite the program. So it's um, revolutionary in many ways. And our goal is not simply to train a number of individuals. Our goal is to really create an ecosystem and a community where the first generation of a first cohort of graduates, uh, we will leverage to be TAs, teaching assistants and mentors for future generations and cohorts. And so um, we've done something very similar in Colombia where, you know, again, we're going way beyond training individuals and, and getting people jobs. We're really trying to create a self-sustaining community and ecosystem. And we're really excited to do that with all of you. Um, our, uh, now, this web introductory webinar is open to um, uh, anyone who applied to the program. Um, we had in this first cohort um, over 8,000 uh, extremely talented individuals apply to the program. We only had room in our first cohort for 500 of those people for, uh, to get seats. Um, but there's two things uh, we want to mention for all of you who are not part of that first 500. Um, uh, number one is our plan is to train 10,000 people over the next three years. So we're going to have many additional cohorts between now and, and year end 2022. Um, so you will have further opportunities to come into the program if, um, you know, if you're not joining us for the first cohort, that's, that's point number one that we want to make. Point number two is we're going to be giving everyone, every applicant, um, a kind of a resource pack where um, uh, if they felt like they weren't ready for day one of the class, that we're going to provide kind of preparatory material so that over the next few months um, or the next couple of quarters, you can study that material at your own pace and be in a better position to apply it to a future cohort of the program um, because we want everyone to benefit, not just people in the first cohort and not just people in, our, in, in all of our future cohorts that we want to make this um, a value proposition for everyone involved. And this uh, you know, introductory webinar is an example of that where um, we, we are committed to helping everyone uh, benefit. Um, you know, we can only uh, have a certain limited number of seats in the first cohort, um, but we can help um, outside of the class as well, and we're committed to doing so. Um, uh, all of you can, uh, you know, can go back to, in, in a few days, we're going to open up applications for future cohorts. We'll keep all of you on the mailing list informed, and when those are um, open, we'll, we'll let all of you know. Um, but stay in touch. We have a mailing list on, on the website um, and we'll keep you apprised of all of our future programmings for empowerment and for correlation one more broadly. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Pillai. So let me, uh, one second here, do a proper introduction. So Professor Pillai, is a statistics uh, professor at Harvard University, a fully tenured professor of statistics, and he's the chief scientist of Correlation One. He is an interdisciplinary scientist working on problems lying at the interface of applied probability and statistics with a research focus on Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms and problems in climate science. He obtained his bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai in 2003 as well as his PhD from Duke University in 2008. He won the Young Scientist Award from the International Indian Statistical Association in 2018. He serves as the associate editor in the leading scientific journals for statistics and data science. And he's also the director of the graduate program in statistics at Harvard University. And finally, he is also a big part of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. So without further ado, I turn it over to you, uh, Professor Pillai. Thank you, Rashid. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, I can see there is a little bit of lag, so I'm going to pay attention to that. So I'll wait for your comments. I must say it's bizarre watching myself on YouTube. I sent this link to my mother and family and stuff. Your son is a star. <laughs> uh, let's, there you go. Hey, Mikisha. Uh, Sola, 
I, I'm pretty sure I cannot pronounce your last name. I'm going to try. Hey, what's up, Sebastian? <laughs> hey, James. <laughs> How are you? Uh, you know, I'm so grateful, first of all, that you've applied to a program. Um, I have, you know, I'm, I've dedicated my career towards, at least some of it, towards education. And that it, it, this, is a, this is a project that is so close to my heart that truly education is something to be accessible for everyone. And so this year I am on um, sabbatical from Harvard. And, and this is one of the best things I could do in my career to really reach out to the entire range of people and really tr truly communicate with a uh, field um, in my field and, and really understand what are the needs for, for this, uh, to communicate what the needs for are this, ma this material uh, that we teach in our course. Um, yeah, Nicolas Rojas, I'm a YouTube star, right? I mean, <laughs> um, hey, Rahim, um, let's keep the comments coming. I'm watching you all. Um, so, you know, we're just getting started, right? So we want to make sure that, as Rashid mentioned, we, we want everyone to be in our program. And it, will be, it, will, it is our dream to have the entire world. You know, it's really a global village, right? Where we have different people. I see people from Nigeria, from Colombia. Hola. <laughs> uh, I need to learn some, some um, uh, phrases um, that I can communicate to my friends from Africa. I don't know yet. Um, well, so, hey, thank you. Where are you from? Uh, you know, it, this, this is something amazing. And I'm really also truly grateful to my um, teammates and Correlation One for, for all our vision. This is a teamwork. I get to do and come and talk in front of you guys, but they do also a lot of hard work. So they need a little bit of thanks as well. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So yeah, thank you. I mean, it's going to be great, guys. So, you know, we just want to, I just want to make sure you know that we're going to, um, hopefully have another chance to really fully immerse you in the course as well. But for right now, let's just talk about, let's go right into what I wanted to talk to you about today, right? So what I was um, thinking about was the following. Um, maybe why don't we just talk about two or three examples of case studies in, things, in terms of why, why the course now? What is the demand for this course? Um, and why wasn't this maybe even available or even, you know, in the market uh, thinking about this in for 10 years ago, right? Okay, so here is an icebreaker. Mm, one second, sorry, let me just start. Okay, so imagine that the time was in uh, 2013, okay? So maybe seven years ago and Hurricane Francis, um, was about to hit the US coast. Now, imagine that you were, you were the data science manager or actually managing a huge team of data scientists in Walmart, let's say. Question to the chat, what would you do to sort of uh, increase the business, increase the revenue? Again, there is no one right answer for this, right? This is also a philosophy of our course that throughout this, we will emphasize on principles that there are no right answer or right approach for one, one, um, one, one question, uh, but rather that there are principles that we teach and then you can really form intuitive answers uh, based on the principles that we teach you. So let's answer this question, right? So what would, you, what, would, what would you do thinking about how would you increase revenue? What is the business opportunity here? And increase water supply, I like that. Miriam, I believe your answer is based on the fact that, well, you know, people would need um, the essentials, right? And sure. And post-COVID, definitely we say toilet paper, clearly. I mean, you know, since when did we start hoarding toilet paper, right? I, I mean, I think, is that the rock bottom? I just, I'm just curious. Anyway, um, yeah, increase water, dry food. Yeah, so, so, okay, so I see many interesting answers. So question to the class, what do you think was the most best-selling item during this time? I see water as one of the answers. Um, what else? Uh, 
paper towels. This is pre-COVID, guys. This was in 2013. So um, sleeping bags, uh, maybe bread, milk, eggs, water. I see many batteries, flashlights. Okay, so do you want to know the answer? Ready? Ready? The most selling item was beer. So, so when I saw when I saw that when I read this I thought okay you, you know you guys are all speaking too highly for the human race right come on I mean so when I saw this I thought we had never getting alive out of this planet right so and the and the second and also the strawberry pork tart what the demand was like seven times larger and you can really see. Um, yeah, they're like, you know, this is an interesting food for the kids and, you know, and you can make them eat, etc. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I share your spirit. Beer? Well, I don't know. What can I say? I mean, this is real, by the way. I mean, you know, this is uh, well documented. I'm not like making this stuff up. So now, now let's think about what, what data science is doing in this problem, right? So, all right, clearly Walmart wants to stock up on this. Question to the class. So how, how do you, what, what do you think Walmart should do to really sort of, how, how does Walmart predict the demand? Any ideas? Like what is the uh, role of data science in this in Walmart needing to predict the demand for it? Um, <laughs> uh, Danny, that is a that is a 20, 20 second lag. I wish I could really see the immediate reaction. You know, um, yeah, yeah. So this was some Walmart sales, exactly. So yeah, so Miriam, you're right. Why are you from Miriam, by the way? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Miriam is saying that you analyze the data from um, uh, Walmart uh, or other customer uh, data from similar natural disasters, or you look at the data from the past where you had similar issues and you see what products were in demand the most. And then of course you include the time of the year and all of that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but now comes, so now here is the, um, another reason to think about this holistically. So let me just write Miriam's answer, which is the predict demands, predict demand using past data. And of course, this is clearly where prediction algorithms from modern data science would definitely help for this because that's what, you know, they, you look at data and then they can help you definitely predict this. But this is, for this to be a viable business idea, I claim that two important things, two important technological advances should have happened or must have happened for this to be an important, to be the, to, for this to be a viable idea for business, for increasing revenue. What are they? Just want to make sure that the question is clear, so I'll repeat it again. So I'm just going with Miriam's idea, which is a wonderful idea, which is to really say, well, you can really predict the demand for these items using the past data from, from um, customers. So for, for that, and basically to generate revenue and increase business during that times, um, I'm claiming that two important technological advances should have also happened. Well, Mahbub, machine learning, well, it's just a f one phrase, right? I'm not really understanding what you what you really mean. Um, Akina says, Akina, where are you from, by the way? So Akina says, you need to have be able to have previously tracked purchases. Yes. You have the data, by the way. They all have data warehouses. Um, yeah, I see one answer, which is, absolutely correct is to see, um, let me see if I can write this. So it basically have efficient inventory management, right? Not only it's enough to really predict the, um, not only is it enough to really predict the demand, etc. you also need to have inventory management. So, you know, Amazon for each quarter 
manages billions of like maybe i don't know what 100 billion um i think on the order of magnitude of 100 billion uh in terms of its inventories right going from one place to the other and it does it all automatically right so basically conducting business at scale so you really need to to uh have algorithms that help you manage and uh, navigate your inventory and also optimize your supply chain um, scale and all of that. Okay, so that's one. Now, what's the other one? Well, there are maybe a few other things as well, but I also claim that there's something else that you would need to uh, for this to be a viable plan. What, what else could that be? Um, hint, think holistically. Think not only in the context of this problem. It, this, is an, this is a question is meant to get at the idea that technology really touches all other parts of our lives, that, you know, things are correlated with each other, that things, one, you know, technology could, ex, you know, affect in one area or advance in one area that truly changes the, the result in other areas. So Henry, um, Ajagawa, sorry, I can't pronounce your last name yet. Let me try. Ajag, Ajagbawa, is that right? Ajagbawa. So segment, he says, segment customers from past sales data to optimally target certain groups. Okay, that's a really good thought, Henry. I like that. But um, the technology, I would say, has advanced to do that. Casey, I already, yes, you're right. So supply chain management that I, I'm going to chalk it to the inventory management group that that basically takes care of that as well. Something else, something else that technology must have advanced to be able to do this. Um, open the store 24 hours. Yes, but that has nothing to do with technology. Hire more people and pay them extra wages, right? Um, is that, isn't that right, Mabu? At least in my neighborhood in India, my father ran a grocery store, by the way. And you know, man, he works so hard. I mean, you know, you think we work hard? We have to look at those guys. Um, ah, yes, I see one more answer. By the way, I could talk about this all day. I have quite a lot of things to talk about. We'll see how people, you know, how much people want to talk about it. Like, if, you know, when you say eventually, Nate, shut up, I'll stop. Okay, so I'll keep going <laughs> until you guys say stop. Yeah, so the other thing that uh, we needed advancement, I don't see this answer here, so I'll explain my answer, is that you needed to predict when does hurricane hit, right? Imagine that if you couldn't, so when does hurricane hit? Why is this important? So imagine that if you could only predict this in maybe just a day in even advance, no matter how much advancement you make in your inventory or prediction of the demand, if you don't know this well in advance, you can't really do this, right? You can't really make money off of this. So if you look at the weather prediction these days, you will see that you can really get accurate well, accurate is a relative word, but you still can get results for about predict weather in about nine days in advance, right? And, and that is definitely an advancement in computing power and technology that we couldn't do this even a few years ago. So yeah, one of my research areas um, is climate. I study climate science in my free time. Um, and uh, you know, it's one of the most important problems of our lifetimes, right? And so, yeah, it's amazing what we have done technologically there. So you can see, right, I want to take this moment to think about why, why, in, why so this, this field is so diverse, so challenging, so interesting, because so many disparate things is going on. Technology is touching all different parts of our lives. And then one, you know, making advancement in one area naturally has an impact on the other. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay, so that's all I wanted to say there. 
So now let's go on to the case studies, right? That was a nice breaker. Nice to see so many people. And thank you so much for all the comments, right? One of the things that we really do as part of our um, education is that we, we do the same interaction in Slack so that you could interact with the teaching staff. We have, you know, personal mentors and all of that, right? So um, we, we would, you know, we want to make sure that you get to learn and we will give you uh, in our course that we actually give you every opportunity to um, not only interact with me, but also interact with your fellow B, uh, fellow students. And this is because, you know, you learn mo the most from your peers, right? You would spend a lot of time with them working on team projects, etc. Okay. Okay. So now comes one of my favorite case studies. How many people play chess here? I'm a chess fanatic. Let's say how many people play chess? Mm. Me, okay, Miriam, you're on fire. Okay, what is your rating? Uh, what is your rating? I do, France J, okay. Where are you from, France? From France? <laughs> um, checkers, uh, no checkers, please. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from time to time. Okay, so uh, yeah. Do you guys know your rating? Okay, let me put it this way. If you don't know your, what your rating is, I will beat you. I mean, so <laughs> let, let me put it this way, okay? So, oh, by the way, oh, France, you're living in MA. That's good. Where in Massachusetts? Um. Matthew says he's more of a Sudoku guy. Okay, okay, no judgments here. That's fine to each his own. What can I say? Um, okay, so here is an example of, um, so chess.com is uh, one of the premier sites where you can really play chess on the internet. And here is, um, so here is me. My name is Matt Guy M.A. Well, I know it's not very imaginative, you know. Well, I, I, one day I needed to make up a name, so I just said, uh, you know, okay, I like Matt. Uh, you know, I'm from M.A., Massachusetts. Why not, right? So this is what it does. What it does is that it, it pairs people of similar ratings together. So this is um, uh, this guy from Colombia, by the way. Um, I, and, and he and I have similar ratings and we play five minute games. Okay, so, okay, how does, so let me tell you a little bit about the site. So this is a site where about 1 million people play in a day, the games are free. One of the, um, so the business model here at, is that chess.com you know, it charges a little bit of a, pre, uh, a fee, a monthly subscription fee. And then once you go there, you really pay, play the games, right? That's what it do. The company is really small. They're my friends. It's a small company, about 50 people. It's a wonderful company. Um, so, okay, so what is the problem? So the problem, one of the major problems in um, uh, chess is cheating. Like cheating? Say what? Yeah, I mean, you know, so, I mean, I already told you there is no money in this game, right? Especially this is on a website and, and people play each other. So, okay, so first of all, I need to explain. Okay, what is it for people who are, you know, who don't play chess or no, don't know this backstory? Let me explain how, wh what does cheating really mean? Okay, first of all, why do people cheat, right? Well, it's war. So, so this, there's this kid I'm playing. This kid is about 80 years old. This is on a chess club right next to my home. This kid beat me mercilessly, okay? He's 80 years old. And then not only did he beat me, and then he came and told me after the game, good game, and then walked away. I'm upset for four days. I mean, I don't like to lose. Let me put it this way. Like, you know, if you get into this, like, absolutely, there's nobody cares. Like, absolutely no one cares yet. Um, you know, it's war. So, so now here is a little bit about how the technology um, has affected this 
this area where, so here is Kasparov, Kasparov, one of the greatest players who have ever played the game, um, one of my heroes. Um, here is he playing IBM, Deep Blue. So this is a $10 million supercomputer in 1997, maybe, yeah. And uh, this is a $10 million computer. And until then, a computer has never beaten a world champion in, in uh, real match play, okay? And Kasparov was really um, an emotion, you know, he showed us, he wore his emotions on sleeve. So in, uh, on his sleeve. So, you know, he would, if you, if you're, if he's losing, if you're making a bad, you know, move or something, he'll show it. So this was in 1997 where actually Deep Blue beat Kasparov. And this is, uh, so during that time already, the, uh, the writing was on the wall for humanity. So this is an example where you can see that uh, Kasparov losing the game and just resigning the match, right? Deep. And then what is interesting is that immediately after this, IBM kind of dismantled the, the computer so that nobody at that time knew what actually went, in, went on inside the computer. Okay. What is important for us coming back to the case is the following. Um, nowadays, the computing power has advanced so much that the mobile phone, my mobile phone can beat the world champion. It's not even a joke, right? So what, what, um, so what that means is that people, when they're playing along in the internet, they can just really run their computer to play along, or they can look at their mobile phones and have them play along and see what the computer suggests and then let them go play that. All right, so, so far people are, um, okay, let me just pause there and make sure that people are with me and everything is okay. So can I have a quick pulse check to make sure that people are with me so far? Um, <clears throat> okay, it seems like people good, because, uh, wonderful. Okay, so now, now comes the story. So one day, this guy, this guy and I were playing five minute games, right? So this guy, one day, a guy started beating me. So not only did he beat me, he started with total um, bad moves in the opening and then beating me. Well, I don't like to lose and I was a little bit angry, okay? So what I did was I downloaded all his games from the website. And using the, the methods that we teach in our course, using simple data analytic methods, proved conclusively that he was cheating. And then I wrote to the CEO with this evidence. Now, I don't know what is more petty, that this guy was cheating in a game where there's absolutely no money, or that I couldn't just deal with it. And so I just downloaded all his games and started analyzing whether he's cheating or not, right? Um, so, and by the way, so now um, I am a sort of a consultant for chess.com. Um, I am sort of, I, I sort of know what their cheating algorithms are doing. I really talk with them. They're my friends. They have a wonderful cheating detection team because, you know, it's really important, right? You, you play to a website in a small company where you're going there to play a game and have fun and you can have an opponent from the opposite part of the world. In, you know, if you want to play a computer and get, up, get beaten up mercilessly, why do you go have to play in this site, right? So it's an important problem. So, so the, the technical... Uh, uh, point here is that data science, yes, these are the problems. You can really see how these methods are applicable in every walk of light, in every industry, right? This is important for, uh, this is important for that site and it does for every, it, it, every site nowadays is really having sophisticated cheating mechanisms. Okay, so, so beware, we do catch cheaters, right? So, uh, you know, if, if this is not like a local problem, like New York Times picked the story up, right? Think cheating in ch baseball is bad, try chess. So it's not like, uh, you know, like if New York Times picks up a story, you can, you know, you can bet money on the fact that it's serious, right? Okay, so. Um, okay, so. 
that was a technical point. So I want the class to note that every case study will have a technical point and a strategic point. Technical point is in the sense that what are the utilities of data science tools? How were they used in the industry? What are the tasks they can be used for, right? So here in this case, you can really find abnormalities in the patterns of people in the superhuman play versus the play according to their natural ability. Now comes the strategic point. And this is where this field gets really interesting, where it's about making decisions um, by working together with machines. It's, and this is really not something that, you know, don't ever think that machines can really solve problems for us, right? It's interesting to find a middle ground between what machines give you and knowing when to trust them, et cetera. So the strategic point, which is that why is this a hard problem? Well, think about it from, um, from a CEO's point of view, right? The other day, we um, at chess.com actually really uh, accused a very high profile grandmaster to be cheating. Now, imagine the seriousness of the situation, right? This person, this grandmaster, esteemed grandmaster, spent all his life studying the game, right? And this, this, this is their career. So if, if, they, if you accuse somebody, of the, the somebody to be cheating, that is a serious allegation, potentially pro, pro, putting their career at risk. Well, it has consequences. It means that you might probably get sued. So if you if you are you know using this these outputs from these algorithms, think about that point of view, right? Are you are your methods defensible in court? And also, when do you trust them? When do you get enough evidence to say this person is cheating? And extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Where do you get that from? How do you think through the data? How do you, you know, how do you have a coherent set of evidence that conclusively proves this case? Extremely hard problem, right? And this is where education matters. This is really about, you know, there are methods to do this, but it really requires training. And it's important to understand both the human side of it and also uh, the, the algorithmic side of it. You know, Miriam, I don't want to talk about one particular method such as p-value, so it's not, so my emphasis here is that this is a problem that is not necessarily solved by reading an output of an algorithm. That's the point I'm trying to communicate. Rather, the, 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 the point is that how do you really collect multiple pieces of evidence, presumably from different set of algorithms, and still provide coherent evidence. You know, the legal system also works slightly different from the technical system, right? Okay, that's all I would say about that problem. Now, let me, um, okay, by the way, moral of the story is that don't cheat on chess while playing a data scientist, right? This is the profile Harvard did on me um, on, on, on chess. I'm a chess fanatic, and, um, and this is something that, that Harvard had done a small piece on me, among, uh, with other people as well. <laughs> Alejandra, thank you. The feeling is mutual. Um, um, all right, case study two. Uh, so this is an example. This is called, this is uh, Divi. Do people know about this company? Uh, I'll wait to see. I wanna make sure that I don't run too quickly. So I'll wait uh, for two things. One is to have, if people do have any residual thoughts on um, uh, case one or um, anything else? Thank you, Erica. What a pleasure to have you um, on on our broadcast. I haven't heard of it. Okay. Um, okay. So Divi is a company in San Francisco. Okay. So here, here is the. Um, let me give you uh, because we also have an audience from widely around the world. Maybe this may also be a, an opportunity to. Um, to learn from them. So Casey says, ne uh, sorry, uh, somebody said, I think Casey says, never ho heard of them, sound startup -y. Is startup -y a word even? I, should I put this in my lingo, startup <laughs> um, Okay, so here's, so here's what, a, a quick primer about the US mortgage market. So in the US, if you want to buy a home, you need to have two things. One is that you need to put about uh, 10 to 15% in down payment. What does that mean? That if let's say the, how, the home value is about $300,000, you maybe put about 10 to 15%, that that's about $50,000, let's say 45 to $50,000 um, in cash. 
Okay, so in cash, you pay them, and the rest, you sort of um, secure a loan. Now, the loan is also extremely crazy, right? The banks ask you a lot of questions. They ask you your credit scores, right? They ask you uh, your other incomes, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's um, um, you know, I am on, uh, I'm on YouTube on video. So, you know, I have to use, you know, civil language, but you know what I'm trying to say. So here, here's a question though. Um, I want to see, especially from people, you know, from other parts of the world, how does that work in your uh, country? Like, how does the mortgage market work? What do you have, obviously you must have to pay some down payment, right? Or do you, I know in Colombia that people, uh, because the interest rates are so high, people kind of stay away from getting a loan. Is that true in other parts of the world too? Waiting to see. Same in Bolivia. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. But what are the interest rates in Bolivia? It must be quite high, right? At least in the US, the current interest rate is something like maybe 4%. But, uh, but you know, but if you're in Argentina, the interest rate is, I don't know, 15%. I don't know. You know, I don't know how Argentine economy works, right? The inflation is 60%. I give up. Yeah, say, same in Argentina. Okay, Maximo, that's interesting. But your interest rate is what? 50%? 50% per year? Is that, is that true? Oh, Nigeria is also true. Okay, so it's, it's very, very similar. Very similar. Okay. Okay, so now comes the, the point behind Divi. So Divi, the, they are a new innovation in um, home loans. And what they say is that rent less and own more every month. Okay, so what does that mean? And that means the following. Pay attention to this slide carefully, this is important. Um, what this does is that Divi will enable a person to select a home they want to own someday and then to buy that home with Divi's help. What does that mean? That means that, so what is the major impediment in the United States at least to, to in addition to you know, being able to secure the loan, the, the important thing is that the, the person has to have enough down payment. It, that much people might not have that much cash reserve, right? To be able to pay for down payment. So what Divi does is that the customer pays only 2% of the down payment. Divi pays for the rest. So what Divi does, it collects a monthly amount that includes both market rate rent and a small equity payment until the customer builds a good credit for three years, right? So the hope, and this is, this is the business model, this is the innovation. So the hope is that once the customer builds enough credit they can get a loan and how will they get an uh, they get a loan because they have built enough credit and also they have built enough equity because they have been paying divi for a while once they do both of these they can really buy the home from divi right that's the idea let me pause here and this this feels predatory to be honest i mean I, it's not that predatory i mean you know yeah it is a business model right and in fact, if I remember, they raised um, uh, about $30 million maybe two years ago, and I think they're improving more as a company. Anyway, I'm not here to endorse or criticize that company. I'm just being an objective, uh, a neutral observer and, and just showing, highlighting different parts of data science as works in the industry. So now let me pause here. Um, who, are the, who are the prime customers of Divi? Who do you think are the prime customers? Who are the prime target base of Divi? Roberto says millennials. <laughs> are you a millennial, Roberto? Just, I just wanna see where you're coming from. Um, 
So, so low credit, low income people. So, so let's think about two low income people, right? Does that make business sense to really think about giving them to two low income people in the sense that income is too low? A low income cannot be completely their customers, right? Why is that? So carefully think about the business, prop, business uh, model for a minute, right? What they want to do is that eventually they want the customers to buy the home from them, right? So, so yeah, clearly not. So what happens is that their people are not necessarily very low income people, but their customer, the target customer is about near prime in the sense that they cannot yet qualify for a mortgage now, but hopefully for after the three years of steady payments, they can do. Right. That's that's the um, um, customer base. OK, so now that's the background of the case. Now, let's see how is data science useful in this context. So he, here's one. Let's think about the problem, right? The problem is that Divi needs to make sure that the home value will appreciate in three years. Otherwise, why is that? If not, suppose the customer doesn't buy back the home from Divi, then they're stuck with the property. That means that they need to liquidate it, right? So that means that they better make sure that the house is actually increasing in value. The second thing is that, how do you predict the value of the home accurately in three years? Well, that's where, again, the, the predictive analytics methods that some of the methods we actually teach in our own course and also in the, the resources available there. This is where, again, one of the use cases of data science where prediction is useful because in businesses inherently need some sort of prediction for it to work, right? Um, I think the other day, Elon Musk tweeted, what can we not predict? Right, and I, I, I agree with him on that. Um, so, but my point is that that prediction is only one aspect of data science here. And this case study sort of illuminates that in, in several ways. So let's think about, by the way, I'm loving the action on Slack. What I'm going to do is, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer all of the questions in Slack, uh, sorry, in, in the YouTube chat, sorry. Uh, but after this, uh, after this talk is over, I'm going to take, you know, some a, a, a bottle of beer uh, or wine or some alcohol, and I'm going to read through all the comments because I see there are some funny comments there, uh, missing some jokes, I can see. Uh, well, that's okay. All right, so... Okay, so here is another example where you can, you can really see the utility of uh, data science. So even more important issue is think about where the competitive advantage is coming from. Notice that their customer, their target base is people who are near prime and not necessarily who are already have good credit, but not quite bad either. So it's interesting to see where is you have to decide whom should business, Divi do business with. What kind of um, what kind of um, customer base should we give the loan to? Where the business adv advantage, the competitive advantage is coming because what they were doing is they needed to build their own custom credit scoring model. Why is that? Well. If you use the, the existing credit scores from, you know, from, I don't know, Experian and others, maybe they're designed to work across a range of values, right? This is one of the things about prediction that may, if you have a model, sometimes the utility of the model is, it's, is measured by how it works on average, but maybe that you don't really need um, to necessarily think about averages here, but working excellent as a single value, right? For a particular customer, will they default or not? So, so of course, understanding, building a custom model, and this is important to know, data science without data or domain knowledge is, is like existing in a vacuum, right? Um, that means that for if in order to build custom credit scoring model, maybe they might have to use extraneous information where the other credit agencies do not have. So let me pause here and ask uh, the class, um, what, what do you think are, could be, if you were to build a custom credit model in this case, what, what do you think should be the, uh, you know, some extra piece of information that you can use? that could, could give you a competitive advantage.
any thoughts? Uh, Theoria, by the way, where are you from? Salary, yes. Assets, yes. Uh, income stability data. Number of kids going to school, yes. All excellent answers, age and income job type, education level, exactly, right? Maybe the custom credit scoring models do not have this data, but maybe that if you have these data or maybe that, you know, you just wanna make sure that they do not default, right? So this is all interesting. And often the custom credit scoring models do not use this information. Sorry, the ex ex existing credit scoring models may not have access to this information, which is sort of vital for, for, uh, for building a better credit scoring model. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is what I was saying before, the data science, the way the technical data aspect of data, how data science can help here, it's basically giving a, you know, a competitive model for uh, building a better credit score and using better prediction methods. Okay, but now comes the strategic point. Even if you know if you, even if you have built a model which has a custom credit scoring model, you have to really know how good is the model because it's a new model. So the question is, how do you validate the model? The only, so that leads us to something called experimentation. Again, we, we spent in our course quite a bit of time discussing experimentation, right? Data analytics and data science is not all about big data, right? It's not, people say, oh, it's big data, right? Nobody knows what that is. It's so an important part of doing data science and really producing, doing innovation, especially in the online space is doing experiments. Um, really thinking, of setting up, designing experiments, analyzing experiments. So in this context, it, it, an experiment means really thinking about a sort of a smaller group of customers who and understanding who to give loans to and whom to not give loans to and understanding which part for which group of customers do our model predicts really does our model predict really well and what group of customers um, in which our model is relatively uh, not that good and how and how often to give them and etc so all of these questions by the way so let me just pause here these questions the answer to this particular question of doing how to do experimentation and how to think about experiments it's not about coding at all. So I just want people to understand that as well, right? That of course we do teach coding and assume um, no, no background in coding, but this example should, should sort of tell you, uh, give you an insight that it's not, data science is not only about just working in the computer and really get, you know, right, running a piece of code and getting the answers, no. It's, it it's also involves really hard thought um, yes, so I think AS1, H2, W, I3 says trial and error. That's right. Trial and error in the scientific world is called experimentation. And it, there, it's been a field um, established about 50 years of really amazing research um, that, that people need to know, right? And I also want to point out that what is important about this field is that the same set of ideas that are, tra are transportable from one context to the next. So here um, we talk about experimentation to figure out whom to give loans to and whom not to give loans to. The same, once you understand the basic principles, you can work anywhere in the tech industry, in the government, in, in, in the private sector, etc. For instance, if you, um, if you are in the government, you really want to know the pol. For instance, if you want to implement a policy of understanding, let's say, if better education at the primary school level lead to better overall outcomes of pupils who actually take the class, should we pay our teachers more so that they, you know, they're incentivized to teach more because then eventually will lead up to betterness of our society. That's doing an experimentation. That's not a coding question at all. That requires hard thought of understanding the principles of experimentation. So the point I'm trying to make here is that data science is a diverse field, right? And let's think about this. Um, so data science involves coding, thinking about the technical aspects of it, thinking about just getting your hands dirty, about analyzing data, but also thinking about different um, ways of implementing uh, the experiment, conducting an experiment. 
right? So this is why it's diverse. And even if a person is generally educated in one aspect, it's, it's unlikely that they like they would be you know educated in all the other aspects as well, because this is a field that was formulated out of necessity. Right, technology has advanced in every aspect that suddenly that if you know not only it's important to know a specialized education on one narrow subfield, you also need to balance that with holistic overall understanding of all different fields so that you can appreciate the diversity in perspectives. You can really see how one thing affects the other, etc. Yeah, understanding incentives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ishmeet, make no mistake that and one of the major aspects of a training program is to not just give you a bunch of code and say execute it and you run it. And, and no, that, that's not what we do. We do, of course, do coding. It's not like we sit around and sing camp songs. No, we do make a do a hand study, but in addition to this, at every in, um, instance, we emphasize the importance of thinking through this problem, right? And um, we call it the uh, content within context, in the sense that you learn the content and the technical. Uh, uh, details of how you implement this, but you learn best in the context of a problem and an underlying problem that you want to solve, right? Yeah, right, exactly, So, hey, All right, so let me pause there um, and wait for a minute to see if people have any residual questions on, um, on that. Um, and also, by the way, so and that we source cases from many different fields. So it's not only just related to tech industry. We actually really take data from uh, many, many other uh, publicly available sources. Yeah, let me just pause here, and um, let me know if I need to explain anything else more. If if not, um, I can present the last case study and then. Um, go back to uh, whatever you were doing before. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so Emotional intelligence is a really good question, um, Asil. Yes, it's important, right? That's why it's related to the problem that I mentioned before, that when do you trust these algorithms, right? And also ethics, that's another thing that, you know, how do you preserve your integrity and still work on problems, right? Um, it's uh, many, many interesting um, interesting questions. By the way, people, did people watch this movie, this documentary called Social Dilemma um, in Netflix? Um, did people watch that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so Adriana, uh, where are you from? Yeah, we will definitely send you a list of resources that you can learn further um, and to really know more about, because the experimentation is super important, right? Everyone does it. Yeah, so what did you all think about Social Dilemma uh, and the movie? What are your thoughts on that? Um, Yeah, it's on your list, Anup and Pova. You should watch it. I, I really want to know. Oh my goodness, yes, Michelle. Yeah, what all did you think about it? I mean, you know, it struck, you know, it resonated with me in certainly some aspects. I wanted to know what all you guys thought about it. It was funny. It was funny in the sense that, you know, from a purely, okay, okay, I, I don't want to air my public comments about that in because in, I'm recorded. I can tell you in private, but I can tell you that I found it interesting that they, <laughs> uh, Marisa, you're funny, but, um, you know, yeah, I did find in the, you know, that you know, people are collectively looking for an attention that data is a commodity, right? Let me just show you. This is an example where in 1990s, something called the Signet Bank aim, aimed at modeling the profitability of credit card people. So this was in 1990. So this was maybe 30 years ago. And what they did was they, they started giving people different credit cards with different interest rates, right? So to really see what credit card 
um, you know, what, what would people accept it to be is the ideal um, credit rating should be, like in the sense that, you know, if obviously if they give you 20% annual interest rate, hell no, you will not accept it. But if, if they gave you like 1% or 2% a year, maybe you'll accept it, right? So this way by experimenting, they really sort of figured out who, what is the sort of the you know, best credit rate to give customers? This, com this Signet Bank had a spin-off. Does anybody want to guess what was the consequence of this? <laughs> no, this is not a con. No, it's not racism. A company was formed out of this experimentation. Any idea what was the, what what was what happened to be a spin-off of the Signet Bank, which actually started doing experiments and really giving giving um, people different credit rates? Any thoughts? The question is that. Signet, yeah, it, it, it turned into a credit rating company. What it, it, so Signet Bank had a spin-off and it started a new company. My question is, what, what company, like, so this was, they were pioneers doing experimentation in the 1990s, but um, do you want me to tell you what the answer is? Not Experian, no, 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 no. It's actually Capital One, right? They they are the spin-off of that bank is one of the largest credit card companies right now, right? So experimentation is extremely important, um, and, and this was they were the pine one of the pioneers long before the tech industry started really doing this, and they were doing this for people um, for people in the um, not United States. The you know they are one of the biggest uh, credit card issuers in the in the United States now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is true. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, okay. So let's do one more case study, and then we'll um, sort of wrap up the case, wrap up today's class. Okay. Um, so case study three. Um, one of the things to notice is that data science, doing data science is no different from um, doing science in the sense that they, you extract information from data, right? That is, it's actually absolutely no different from science. Um, in the science, what, what happens that you come up with the hypotheses, you have many years of experience in this context data, and then you make a conclusion, right? And that's, that's basically... Um, that's what actually happens in data science as well. So but what data science does is that it sort of seeks to automate this reasoning and enhance it by sort of maximizing the information that you can process before making a decision. And, and let me, in this case study, quick case study, let me walk you through, through this. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna iterate from starting with the problem, sourcing the data, and then we go for, you know, do data engineering, data crunching there using, using machine learning and other predictive analytic methods. And then you're going to iterate, right? This is how science works too, that you, you do this iteration process many, many times. So, um, okay, here is my case. What I want to do is predict the revenue of United Airlines from publicly available data, right? That's the goal. So predict can you really predict the revenue of United Airlines from publicly available data? By the way, this case, a friend of mine helped me make it. His name is Zach. So hola, Zach, if you're watching, thanks for all your help on this. It's wonderful. Um, he's from Canada. He lives near North Pole. So if you want to know what Santa brings every day, just ask him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, this, this I did this in, in the last three years. Uh, Miriam, I didn't do this in 2020. Um, 
because obviously, you know, COVID, COVID is a different, different thing. Okay, so um, okay, all right. So so this is what I'm going to do. So one of the first thing is to really say, ask good questions, right? So for instance, um, asking good questions really required domain knowledge because. Um, uh, thank you, Lucia. That's a great comment. I appreciate it. So he here is that, you know, you can't ask good questions really without thinking through the problem. This is another thing that, you know, don't think that data science is one magic bullet of doing AI and all of that. No, data science is about using your understanding of the underlying problem and then using data analytic methods to make a decision, right? So here to see, so instead of saying, um, can you predict quarterly earnings? Instead of saying that, you can really say, can you predict quarterly earnings using something, right? So that's a, so you, can you predict quarterly earnings using some, some uh, data that you already have? Yeah, I just want also the class to know that this webinar was about just giving you some information about what data science is and what our program is all about and what is our training training framework. Like, how do we train people and why do we train people? Because you see, hopefully through these cases, you can see how important it is to use these tools in every industry imaginable, right? And it is said that there are about half a million jobs that go unfilled because there aren't enough people who are trained in these methods to be able to use them in those jobs. Okay, so, all right. So suppose I want to source data, right? Um, <laughs> Zach, you're there, that's funny. Um, welcome, Zach. Um, so question to, to um, to the audience. So where do you think we source data from? Any thoughts on that? Any, where do we, you know, imagine we want to really wanted to predict this data from, you know, revenue from publicly available sources. Where do you think, yeah, so excellent, Miriam. So um, let me just write, PNL statements, you can really get this from every company, you know, publishes their the revenue quarterly in the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission's filings. That data is public. You can go look it up so you can really do that. What else? Can we have some imaginative ideas? Web scraping. Roni, Roni please explain. What do you really mean by web scraping? What specifically uh, do you want to want to scrape for? Um, okay, SCC, yes, SCC I mentioned. Uh, databases that are open source, yes. But I wanna know, I don't want an abstract answer. I specifically wanna know, what specifically do you wanna scrape for? What are you looking for? I don't wanna say web scraping or, you know, I, okay, stock price for what? Ah, Dreaming Lotus. Is that your real name, Dreaming Lotus? Come on, what is your name? Dreaming Lotus, I love that. Yes, Twitter. So Twitter, why do you need Twitter data? Why do you think Twitter data is useful? Um, yes, yeah, surveys is good, but surveys I'm not sure is publicly available actually. Um, surveys I'm not sure is publicly available. So Dreaming Lotus, I wanna go back to your answer. What, what, what do you think you can use Twitter for? Um, yeah, um, yeah, for using hashtags. Yeah, I guess you can really see hashtags United Airlines, but why do you think people tweet sometimes, right? Maybe that you can really think of Twitter data as basically measuring consumer sentiments that maybe people are, you know, if people are tweeting too much or too little, you are in trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or you can really see what is trending and all of that. Okay, so we have these two, um, which is, and then you, what else can you do? Of course, somebody said flight patterns. Yes, you can really look at um, what, what uh, if you're predicting the revenues of United Airlines, you can really think about the publicly available data in which uh, you can see 
what airports, uh, how much are they going, how much the flight is filled, etc. But you get that information. Actually, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics really publishes that data, so you can really use that. Okay, I see many answers. I see I don't see one important answer that is sort of important. So I'll wait here for a minute and wait for some more answers. There is another important aspect, I think, where I can really get that data publicly, where you have I haven't seen the answers. Um, Stocks, in what way, a seal? Stock. Oh, yes, exactly, Anna Power. Fuel prices. Fuel prices, exactly. You have to know the price of oil. Now, where do you think, where do you, think the you can get the price of oil from in the future? Where? You can probably get from the options market or the futures market. You really look at oil futures, right? And um, so let me just write here for oil futures. So, okay, so, and then, so let me show you what we have done. So of course, using the Bureau of Transportation Statistics passenger airline data that is directly relevant to predicting revenue, uh, price of oil, directly relevant to predicting oil costs. Twitter, that you can really use as a proxy for the actual usage, but that's okay. It's real time, right? And then, of course, there are many, many other things. Now, important to know when to stop as well. Like, of course, you haven't gotten all day to do this, right? The, the point is to know when to stop going down this rabbit hole and say, okay, when is it enough, actually? Yeah, you can also use the stock market data for the actual stock of United Airlines, also used in the revenue prediction. I don't think we used it, but we could definitely use that. Um, now, one thing I do want to talk about is that, you know, let me tell you this. Big data is not equal to better data. Okay, can we just pin this, please? Big data not equal to better data. Absolutely false. False, as the Germans would say. Um, tell me how to say false in, in some other language that I don't know. I know Spanish, but something else. Um, maybe some, some African language. How do you say false? Uh, Yeah, um, so hey, yes, you, uh, fox, fox is, uh, fall, 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 yeah, that's French, okay, fall, uh, uh, Mali, ma falso, falso, sec, <laughs> not equal to Ronnie, you take the cake, so yeah, so one thing to notice that, you know, big data is not equal to better data, right, it's in the sense that the quality of data really matters, right, examples in this case between Choose daily Twitter data from one account, or you look at multiple data from month, month or monthly, you aggregate monthly data from multiple accounts, right? Um, so many decisions to make, right? Um, okay, of course I know Galat in Hindi. Of course I speak Hindi, man. Come on. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in India. Um, yes, false in German. That's right. Um, yeah, so. Right. So, it, it's, so I think this is important that, you know, garbage in and garbage out, right? Let me put it this way. I think maybe this is something worth saying that 50% of the time as a data scientist, um, you spend your time in cleaning the data. This may be called the unsexy parts of the job, but this is important. You truly, you truly have to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time cleaning your data before before it's ready for doing whatever algorithms you do, right? This is important and often is overlooked. People think that, you know, there is a lot of prep work that is involved, that is hard work and not necessarily the most glamorous parts of the job, but yet, yet you know, every job, yeah, data wrangling, exactly. Every job has its good parts and bad parts, right? So, okay, so now let's look at, let's look at, um, here is an example of publicly available data that you, you have to get used to with this issue. So study this plot carefully where the, this is the passenger BTS Bureau of Transportation Statistics where the, this is the US Airways incorporated data 
And suddenly there is a break in 2015 and 2016. What do you see? What do you see? Can anyone have a guess on why there is, yeah, it looks pretty seasonal, but it's missing. Yes, Kimmy, is discontinuity. Yes, exactly, Kapil, good job. That you see that the discontinuity there is because there was a merger with the American Airlines. So you can see that American Airlines suddenly jumped in that, in that time. Right? Yeah, exactly. This is merger. Now, you have to go look for it, right? The point that I'm trying to make is that this is daily, this is going to be a part of your daily life in data analysis, that you have to know the domain. You have to have the domain knowledge to really think through this problem to see why is there a discontinuity there, right? You know algorithm. Algorithms might pick this up, but you don't know how it's using. Right, and more importantly, in addition to that, that if you know and incorporate for this merger in the data set, in your method, in whatever you were trying to do, of course your results would be better, right? This is something important, and this is, goes to my earlier point that data science without domain knowledge is useless. Okay, the most I want to go relatively quickly because we've talked quite a uh, lot already, um, but I'll just make it uh, make the rest of it quick. So here is maybe let me just pause one more example. So here is the Twitter data, the tweets from um, 2012 to uh, 2020. Of course, you could use this. Now think about this Twitter in which uh, quite sorry. Um, this is the Twitter data in 2017, where it uh, it was quite a lot. Do you do you know why this was? Keep going. <laughs> I could keep going, but you know uh, that's okay. Yeah. Do you know why in 2017 why this was? Any thoughts? Suddenly, there was a spike. Not Trump. Yes, when that Asian uncle was thrown off the plane. <laughs> Where do you guys come up with this? Yes, this was exactly what happened. That <laughs> Asian uncle was thrown off the plane. Okay, guys, keep it, keep it. Uh, Keep it civil. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah, so what happened was that airlines routinely overbook, and then what happens is that this passenger refused to get off the plane, and he was dragged off. And this was really, um, you know, a big, big issue, big news. Exactly. And what is interesting is that the publicly available data picks that up. Right. It's very interesting to notice that this is what I was saying, the amount of information that is contained, you know, public data is a treasure trove of information and Twitter picks that up. You know, we, we all live in a connected world. Now, of course, it's a different story to think about. Well, you will see a spike in that that day's Twitter activity and it's went several times the question you want to really think about is how do you pre-process the data um how do you pre-process the data and does that really help in predicting the revenue or it's irrelevant or you know should you keep it or not right yeah so so that's something important right um okay so now let me um, and this is again the quarterly earnings. Then you can, if you know, you can really also think about you know the connection between revenue and profit, and would you want to consider that in your model? Um, here is something else that is important: do not trust data from the sources you see. 
free data, there's no free lunch, right? Free data, um, sorry, free data has its problems. So let me go to the previous slide, one second. Let me write, free data, even paid, even if you paid for a data set, do not trust, don't trust completely, right? They're useful, they definitely give you information. But what do I really mean? That imagine this is the data that is actually uh, from, let's say, American Airlines Group. And this was the quarterly earnings. And you can really see in March 31st, 09, you can really see that that quarter's earning was an order of magnitude smaller than the previous months. Now, that definitely is suspicious. So one of the things you can't really do is they can cross check with their SCC filings um, where, and just to see what that was. And then you really see that indeed that was an error that that, that is quarterly revenue or at least uh, as reported data was uh, completely wrong, right? So this, this gives you two important points of things to think about. One is the, the fact that you have, uh, you have, information that you have to be careful about and pay attention to and often it pays dividends really to cross check information right and this is important that often part of cleaning is also to really cross reference different data sets this has a name in the scientific literature it's called record linkage what does that mean it means that you have disparate pieces of disparate documents that you know contain similar information and you want to sort of cross link with each other it's not just that data can be manipulated, um, Sherry. It's not just that. Um, um, it, it's just that, you know, we are humans, that sometimes, you know, even machines make mistakes of uploading data. Who knows that what, how, what that data source is, that what, what happens, you know, who knows who input that? Maybe that person who was inputting that day that had a bad day, was in a bad mood, or somebody made a sandwich really bad. Who knows what's happening, right? Um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's interesting that double entry accounting. I didn't know. Okay, good to know. That makes sense to me. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and we talked about lots of data is not good data, etc. Now, um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the machine learning aspects of it that, you know, it's about taking the raw Twitter data. Like one thing you can really think about, you know, pre-processing this Twitter data to make it better for, for using it is to, one thing is to remove the outliers, right? You can really say that number um, uh, really doesn't make much sense to me. I can sort of delete it. That's one way, but let's not, you know, you know, typically it's not recommended that you throw away data. So here is a concept, is an elementary concept that you might learn from elementary schools that, that, you know, that's useful here. So what is the difference between mean and median? When would you use mean versus when would you use median? Mean, right? Um, so one way you can really think of solving this problem is to take a moving average of the tweets so that you can protect against these large spikes because you're taking the moving average of, of the spikes. You can do that, but that particular spike was so big that even taking the moving average does not really help you there. So here is where um, innovative, you know, innovative thinking really helps. Use median, right? Why is median helpful in this case? Because it tells you, it, it protects you from outliers. It, it, it makes you robust against large tweets like this, where we think this might not be that relevant to predicting here. So let's really, because we, you know, what is the point of using Twitter? We want to use this as a real-time proxy for having a running commentary about what the consumer sentiment is. Right. Clearly, this data is not necessarily maybe just not a complete summary of the ongoing consumer sentiment. People just were tweeting a viral story, which may or may not have relevance to the problem. One way you can, you know, you can sort of incorporate that in this problem is to really think about the medians, right? Medians, um, which, which protect you against outliers. 
And I want to point out that, you know, there are a million little tricks like this, that this comes from experience. Um, this Zach did it and he showed me, and he has to give him credit for that. It's uh, wonderful that, you know, he did it out of his experience. Um, and this is what something that, this field where it's cumulative, the experience compound on each other. Okay, so I think we are, I want to wrap up the case. And, and you know, there are, I can really talk about many different aspects of visualization. Maybe let me show you one interesting visualization just to show you that how, again, publicly available data has you know, so much information that is available. So here is one animation of, again, using publicly available data to show you how Spirit Airlines have expanded their flight flight routes in the recent years. So pay attention to this area. This is south, somewhere in South Pacific. I don't quite really know what exactly this island is. Maybe Fiji, I'm not sure. But you pay attention to what happens there. Let me play that animation for you. Um, so this is where initially it was in there. In 2012 onwards, they're putting more, more um, flights there. So let me play that animation one more time. Pay attention to what happens in that in that circle. So here we go. Initially, they didn't have very much. But then as time went on, they had more of that. Um, here is a here is a uh, uh, another visualization. So of course, you know, I, I don't see I saw this being mentioned by other people. So when you do analysis, and not only, yeah, Guam. Okay, Sherry, thank you. Guam, maybe that's right. Another thing to think about is that, you know, not, it's enough, it's not just enough to predict if you want, even if you want to predict the revenue of United Airlines, it's just not, you know, it might be useful to look at their competitors too. Why is that important? Because imagine that, let's say Spirit, right? If Spirit and United have the same flight routes from one city to the other, then there are two ways you can, United can really increase their revenue. One is to increase the actual customer base who purchase tickets from you. The other is to steal customers from a competing airlines. So if, from a zero sum um, game point of view, what you can do is to think about what are the, you know, uh, look at the competitors and say, is actually, is Spirit increasing their flight patterns? Can we really look at that over the years? If maybe if Spirit is also increasing their, you know, increasing more services, then maybe it is worth taking that account into account in the prediction model because they are stealing probably customers from United, right? It's a very, so in this, in the point I'm gonna to try to make here is that any source of information is useful. Like no data is little, right? You actually take anything that 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 come into your way. So here is the animation of Spirit, and you can really see that Spirit in the in the last few years has really increased their flight patterns dramatically. In particular, they've um, they've uh, you know spent flights to South America and different parts, even in, increased the connectivity within the U.S. All of that. So and this again. Just folks, I, we didn't have access to private data. This is all from publicly available data, right? It's almost miraculous that we can actually do so much using the stuff that is out there. All we really need is this, the training to do this, right? That's the point I wanted to emphasize through this case study that the training to do this is what comes from our cases. Okay, so let me end the case by showing that, um, of course we predicted, um, these are machine learning methods. I'm going to go through them. So this is the final slide I want to point out that this is the actual, the, the yellow is the um, actual data that we trained on and the black is the prediction. And you can really see that these are the predicted means and these are the uncertainty estimates. This is pre-COVID of course. Um, um, this is pre-COVID of course. Um, um, and you can really see that it, the algorithm predicts extremely well, right? That it turns out that not only we get the prediction using all of this publicly available data, we, we predict extremely well. And that this is truly surprising to me. Of course, Zach is really good at what he does, but still, this is truly, truly surprising that you can really get these data 
which are, you know, if I didn't tell you, if I didn't show you evidence for this, you know, you might say, you're just, you're just making up stuff. Is this even possible? The answer is yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so that's the technical point. The, the, the final thing that I want to point out is the, what is the, um, of course, you know, I wouldn't even dare to do this post-COVID because, you know, that's why you have to be humble as a data scientist because none of these would work in post-COVID because the market has experienced a shock. Absolutely, you can do nothing, right? You have, you need different set of ideas to predict that. Um, so I want to just end with um, the strategic point, which is that, uh, the last slide, that what we say is that we started with an idea, formulated the problem, sourced the data, did data engineering and data crunching, and did iteration. We did this cycle of iteration again and again and again and again, right? This is definitely part, of, this is part and parcel of what a day in a life of a data scientist would look like. And that's the strategic point that you have to, you know, you, if you're working as a data scientist in the industry, your workforce or um, uh, you, you and your fellow team members would be doing this many, many, many times across many, many things. And that's how the world works, right? And that's what the training is letting you do, to really do this um, so often. Okay, so I'll quit here and stop here. Um, what, what, a, what a pleasure to have um, so many people being a part of us. Um, we are all together in this journey. You know, learning should be fun and we want high quality education accessible to um, all of you. And I really hope that um, in, in this cohort or the few subsequent cohorts, all of you will be able to be with a part of us. Um, and I really in, in, um, look forward to um, uh, being with all of you. Thanks so much. Um, have, have a good weekend. Um...